Project Gemini was NASA's second human spaceflight program. Conducted between projects Mercury and Apollo, Gemini started in 1961 and concluded in 1966. The Gemini spacecraft carried a two-astronaut crew. Ten Gemini crews flew low Earth orbit LEO missions during 1965 and 1966, putting the United States in the lead during the Cold War space race against the Soviet Union. Gemini's objective was the development of space travel techniques to support the Apollo mission to land astronauts on the Moon. It performed missions long enough for a trip to the Moon and back, perfected working outside the spacecraft with extravehicular activity EVA, and pioneered the orbital maneuvers necessary to achieve space rendezvous and docking. With these new techniques proven by Gemini, Apollo could pursue its prime mission without doing these fundamental exploratory operations. All Gemini flights were launched from Launch Complex 19 LC-19 at Cape Kennedy Air Force Station in Florida. Their launch vehicle was a Gemini Titan II, a modified intercontinental ballistic missile ICBM. .Gemini was the first program to use the newly built Mission Control Center at the Houston Manned Spacecraft Center for Flight Control. The astronaut corps that supported Project Gemini included the Mercury 7, the New 9, and the 1963 astronaut class. During the program, three astronauts died in air crashes during training, including both members of the prime crew for Gemini 9. This mission was flown by the backup crew, the only time a backup crew has completely replaced a prime crew on a mission in NASA's history to date. Gemini was robust enough that the United States Air Force planned to use it for the Manned Orbital Laboratory MOL program, which was later cancelled. Gemini's chief designer, Jim Chamberlain, also made detailed plans for cislunar and lunar landing missions in late 1961. He believed that Gemini spacecraft could fly in lunar operations before Project Apollo, and cost less. NASA's administration did not approve those plans. In 1969, McDonnell Douglas proposed a «Big Gemini» that could have been used to shuttle up to 12 astronauts to the planned space stations in the Apollo Applications Project AAP. The only AAP project funded was Skylab, which used existing spacecraft and hardware, thereby eliminating the need for Big Gemini. Topic Pronunciation The constellation for which the project was named is commonly pronounced, the last syllable rhyming with I. However, staff of the Manned Spacecraft Center, including the astronauts, tended to pronounce the name, rhyming with knee. NASA's Public Affairs Office issued a statement in 1965 declaring J -E -H -M -I -H -N -A", to be the «official» pronunciation. Gus Grissom, acting as Houston capsule communicator when Ed White performed his spacewalk on Gemini 4, is heard on flight recordings pronouncing the spacecraft's call sign, J -E -H -M -I -H -N -A 4 and the NASA pronunciation is used in the movie First Man. Topic. Program origins and objectives The Apollo program was conceived in early 1960 as a three-man spacecraft to follow Project Mercury. Jim Chamberlain, the head of engineering at the Space Task Group STG, was assigned in February 1961 to start working on a bridge program between Mercury and Apollo. He presented two initial versions of a two-man spacecraft, then designated Mercury Mark II, at a NASA retreat at Wallops Island in March 1961. 
Scale models were shown in July 1961 at the McDonnell Aircraft Corporation's offices in St. Louis, after Apollo was chartered to land men on the Moon by President John F. Kennedy on May 25, 1961. It became evident to NASA officials that a follow on to the Mercury program was required to develop certain spaceflight capabilities in support of Apollo. NASA approved the two-man program rechristened Project Gemini Latin for «twins» in reference to the third constellation of the Zodiac with its twin stars Castor and Pollux, on December 7, 1961. McDonnell Aircraft was contracted to build it on December 22, 1961. The program was publicly announced on January 3, 1962, with these major objectives To demonstrate endurance of humans and equipment in spaceflight for extended periods, at least eight days required for a moon landing, to a maximum of two weeks To effect rendezvous and docking with another vehicle, and to maneuver the combined spacecraft using the propulsion system of the target vehicle to demonstrate extravehicular activity either or space walks outside the protection of the spacecraft, and to evaluate the astronauts' ability to perform tasks there to perfect techniques of atmospheric re-entry and touchdown at a pre-selected location on land. <laughs> Team Canadian engineer Jim Chamberlain designed the Gemini capsule, which carried a crew of two. He was previously the chief aerodynamicist on Avro Canada's Avro Arrow fighter interceptor program. Chamberlain joined NASA along with 25 senior Avro engineers after cancellation of the Arrow program, and became head of the U.S. Space Task Group's engineering division in charge of Gemini. The prime contractor was McDonnell Aircraft Corporation, which was also the prime contractor for the Project Mercury capsule. Astronaut Gus Grissom was heavily involved in the development and design of the Gemini spacecraft. What other Mercury astronauts dubbed Guzmobile was so designed around Grissom's 5 feet 6 inches body that, when NASA discovered in 1963 that 14 of 16 astronauts would not fit in the spacecraft, the interior had to be redesigned. Grissom wrote in his posthumous 1968 book Gemini, that the realization of Project Mercury's end and the unlikelihood of his having another flight in that program prompted him to focus all of his efforts on the upcoming Gemini program. The Gemini program was managed by the Mann Spacecraft Center, located in Houston, Texas, under direction of the Office of Mann Space Flight, NASA Headquarters, Washington, D.C. Dr. George E. Mueller, Associate Administrator of NASA for Mann Space Flight, served as Acting Director of the Gemini program. William C. Schneider, Deputy Director of Mann Space Flight for Mission Operations, served as Mission Director on all Gemini flights beginning with Gemini 6A. Gwenta Vent was a McDonnell engineer who supervised launch preparations for both the Mercury and Gemini programs and would go on to do the same when the Apollo program launched crews. His team was responsible for completion of the complex pad close-out procedures just prior to spacecraft launch, and he was the last person the astronauts would see prior to closing the hatch. The astronauts appreciated his taking absolute authority over, and responsibility for, the condition of the spacecraft and developed a good-humored rapport with him. Spacecraft NASA selected McDonnell Aircraft, which had been the prime contractor for the Project Mercury capsule, in 1961 to build the Gemini capsule, the first of which was delivered in 1963. 
The spacecraft was 18 feet 5 inches meters long and 10 feet meters wide, with a launch weight varying from 7,100 to 8,350 pounds 3,220 to 3,790 kilograms. The Gemini crew capsule referred to as the re-entry module was essentially an enlarged version of the Mercury capsule. Unlike Mercury, the retrorockets, electrical power, propulsion systems, oxygen, and water were located in a detachable adapter module behind the re-entry module. A major design improvement in Gemini was to locate all internal spacecraft systems in modular components, which could be independently tested and replaced when necessary, without removing or disturbing other already tested components. topic reentry module many components in the capsule itself were reachable through their own small access doors unlike mercury gemini used completely solid state electronics and its modular design made it easy to repair gemini's emergency launch escape system did not use an escape tower powered by a solid fuel rocket but instead used aircraft style ejection seats the tower was heavy and complicated, and NASA engineers reasoned that they could do away with it as the Titan II's hypergolic propellants would burn immediately on contact. A Titan II booster explosion had a smaller blast effect and flame than on the cryogenically fueled Atlas and Saturn. Ejection seats were sufficient to separate the astronauts from a malfunctioning launch vehicle. At higher altitudes, where the ejection seats could not be used, the astronauts would return inside the spacecraft, which would separate from the launch vehicle. The main proponent of using ejection seats was James Chamberlain, head of the engineering division of NASA's Space Force Task Group. Chamberlain had never liked the Mercury escape tower and wished to use a simpler alternative that would also reduce weight. He reviewed several films of Atlas and Titan II ICBM failures, which he used to estimate the approximate size of a fireball produced by an exploding launch vehicle and from this he gauged that the Titan II would produce a much smaller explosion, thus the spacecraft could get away with ejection seats. Maxime Faget, the designer of the Mercury Les, was on the other hand less than enthusiastic about this setup. Aside from the possibility of the ejection seats seriously injuring the astronauts, they would also only be usable for about 40 seconds after liftoff, by which point the booster would be attaining Mach 1 speed and ejection would no longer be possible. He was also concerned about the astronauts being launched through the Titan's exhaust plume if they ejected in flight and later added that. The best thing about Gemini was that they never had to make an escape. The Gemini ejection system was never tested with the Gemini cabin pressurized with pure oxygen, as it was prior to launch. In January 1967, the fatal Apollo 1 fire demonstrated that pressurizing a spacecraft with pure oxygen created an extremely dangerous fire hazard. In a 1997 oral history, astronaut Thomas P. Stafford commented on the Gemini 6 launch abort in December 1965, when he and command pilot Wally Schirra nearly ejected from the spacecraft, So it turns out what we would have seen, had we had to do that, would have been two Roman candles going out, because we were 15 or 16 psi, pure oxygen, soaking in that for an hour and a half. You remember the tragic fire we had at the Cape. Jesus, with that fire going off and that, it would have burned the suits. Everything was soaked in oxygen. So thank God. That was another thing, NASA never tested it under the conditions that they would have had if they would have had to eject. They did have some tests at China Lake where they had a simulated mock-up of Gemini capsule, but what they did is fill it full of nitrogen. They didn't have it filled full of oxygen in the sled test they had. 
Gemini was the first astronaut carrying spacecraft to include an onboard computer, the Gemini Guidance Computer, to facilitate management and control of mission maneuvers. This computer, sometimes called the Gemini Spacecraft Onboard Computer (OBC), was very similar to the Saturn Launch Vehicle Digital Computer. The Gemini Guidance Computer weighed 58.98 pounds (26.75 kilograms). Its core memory had 4096 addresses, each containing a 39-bit word composed of three 13-bit syllables. All numeric data was 26-bit 2's complement integers sometimes used as fixed-point numbers, either stored in the first two syllables of a word or in the accumulator. Instructions always with a 4-bit opcode and 9 bits of operand could go in any syllable. Unlike Mercury, Gemini used in-flight radar and an artificial horizon, similar to those used in the aviation industry. Astronauts had no control over Mercury's flight path, and computers flew most of Apollo missions. Gemini crew had full manual control with control sticks for yaw, pitch, and roll and forward or backward. The original intention for Gemini was to land on solid ground instead of at sea, using a rogallo wing rather than a parachute, with the crew seated upright controlling the forward motion of the craft. To facilitate this, the airfoil did not attach just to the nose of the craft, but to an additional attachment point for balance near the heat shield. This cord was covered by a strip of metal which ran between the twin hatches. This design was ultimately dropped, and parachutes were used to make a sea landing as in Mercury. The capsule was suspended at an angle closer to horizontal, so that a side of the heat shield contacted the water first. This eliminated the need for the landing bag cushion used in the Mercury capsule. <laughs> Adapter module The adapter module in turn was separated into a retro module and an equipment module. Topic: <inaudible> Retro module. The retro module contained four solid fuel TM385 Star 13E retro rockets, each spherical in shape except for its rocket nozzle, which were structurally attached to two beams that reached across the diameter of the retro module, crossing at right angles in the center. Reentry began with the retro rockets firing one at a time. Abort procedures at certain periods during lift-off would cause them to fire at the same time, thrusting the descent module away from the Titan rocket. Equipment module Gemini was equipped with an Orbit Attitude and Maneuvering System OAMS, containing 16 thrusters for translation control in all three perpendicular axes forward, backward, left, right, up, down, in addition to attitude control pitch, yaw, and roll angle orientation as in Mercury. Translation control allowed changing orbital inclination and altitude, necessary to perform space rendezvous with other craft, and docking with the Agena Target Vehicle ATV, with its own rocket engine which could be used to perform greater orbit changes. Early short-duration missions had their electrical power supplied by batteries, later endurance missions used the first fuel cells in manned spacecraft. Gemini was in some regards more advanced than Apollo because the latter program began almost a year earlier. It became known as a pilot spacecraft due to its assortment of jet fighter like features, in no small part due to Gus Grissom's influence over the design, and it was at this point where the American manned space program clearly began showing its superiority over that of the Soviet Union with long duration flight, rendezvous, and extravehicular capability. 
The Soviet Union during this period was developing the Soyuz spacecraft intended to take cosmonauts to the Moon, but political and technical problems began to get in the way, leading to the ultimate end of their manned lunar program. <laughs> <laughs> Launch vehicle The Titan II had debuted in 1962 as the Air Force's second-generation ICBM to replace the Atlas. By using hypergolic fuels, it could be stored for long periods of time and be easily readied for launch in addition to being a simpler design with fewer components, the only caveat being that the propellant mix nitrogen tetroxide and hydrazine was extremely toxic compared to the Atlas's liquid oxygen, RP-1. However, the Titan had considerable difficulty being man-rated due to early problems with pogo oscillation. The launch vehicle used a radio guidance system that was unique to launches from Cape Kennedy. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Astronauts. Geek Slayton, as director of flight crew operations, had primary responsibility for assigning crews for the Gemini program. Each flight had a primary crew and backup crew, and the backup crew would rotate to primary crew status three flights later. Slayton intended for first choice of mission commands to be given to the four remaining active astronauts of the Mercury 7, Alan Shepard, Grissom, Cooper, and Shearer. John Glenn had retired from NASA in January 1964 and Scott Carpenter, who was blamed by some in NASA management for the problematic re-entry of Aurora 7, was on leave to participate in the Navy's SEALAB project and was grounded from flight in July 1964 due to an arm injury sustained in a motorbike accident. Slayton himself continued to be grounded due to a heart problem. Titles used for the left-hand command and right-hand seat crew positions were taken from the U.S. Air Force pilot ratings, command pilot and pilot. Sixteen astronauts flew on ten-man Gemini missions. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Crew selection. In late 1963, Slayton selected Shepard and Stafford for Gemini 3, McDivitt and White for Gemini 4, and Shearer and Young for Gemini 5 which was to be the first Agena rendezvous mission. The backup crew for Gemini 3 was Grissom and Borman, who were also slated for Gemini 6, to be the first long-duration mission. Finally Conrad and Lovell were assigned as the backup crew for Gemini 4. Delays in the production of the Agena target vehicle caused the first rearrangement of the crew rotation. The Shira and Young mission was bumped to Gemini 6 and they became the backup crew for Shepard and Stafford. Grissom and Borman then had their long-duration mission assigned to Gemini 5. The second rearrangement occurred when Shepard developed Menier's disease, an inner ear problem. Grissom was then moved to command Gemini 3. Slayton felt that Young was a better personality match with Grissom and switched Stafford and Young. Finally, Slayton tapped Cooper to command the long-duration Gemini 5. Again for reasons of compatibility, he moved Conrad from backup commander of Gemini 4 to pilot of Gemini 5, and Borman to backup command of Gemini 4. Finally he assigned Armstrong and Elliot C. to be the backup crew for Gemini 5. The third rearrangement of crew assignment occurred when Slayton felt that C. wasn't up to the physical demands of Eva on Gemini 8. He reassigned C. to be the prime commander of Gemini 9 and put Scott as pilot of Gemini 8 and Charles Bassett as the pilot of Gemini 9. The fourth and final rearrangement of the Gemini crew assignment occurred after the deaths of C and Bassett when their trainer jet crashed, coincidentally into a McDonnell building which held their Gemini 9 capsule in St. Louis. 
The backup crew of Stafford and Kernan was then moved up to the new prime crew of the re-designated Gemini 9A. Lovell and Aldrin were moved from being the backup crew of Gemini 10 to be the backup crew of Gemini 9. This cleared the way through the crew rotation for Lovell and Aldrin to become the prime crew of Gemini 12. Along with the deaths of Grissom, White, and Roger Chaffee in the fire of Apollo 1, this final arrangement helped determine the makeup of the first seven Apollo crews, and who would be in position for a chance to be the first to walk on the Moon. Missions <laughs> 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 In 1964 and 1965 two Gemini missions were flown without crews to test out systems and the heat shield. These were followed by ten flights with crews in 1965 and 1966. All were launched by Titan II launch vehicles. Some highlights from the Gemini program on Gemini 4, Ed White became the first American to make an extravehicular activity EVA, or space walk, on June 3, 1965. Gemini 5 August 21 29, 1965, demonstrated the eight-day endurance necessary for an Apollo lunar mission with the first use of fuel cells to generate its electrical power. Gemini 6A and 7 accomplished the first space rendezvous in December 1965, and Gemini 7 set a 14-day endurance record. Gemini 8 achieved the first space docking with an unmanned Agena target vehicle. Gemini 10 established that radiation at high altitude was not a problem, further demonstrated the ability to rendezvous with a passive object, and would also be the first Gemini mission to fire the Agena's own rocket. Mike Collins would be the first person to meet another spacecraft in orbit, during his second successful EVA. Gemini 11 set a manned Earth orbital altitude record of 739.2 nautical miles kilometers in September 1966, using the Agena target vehicle's propulsion system. This record still stands as of 2017. On Gemini 12 Edwin. Buzz. Aldrin became the first space traveler to prove that useful work could be done outside a spacecraft without life-threatening exhaustion, due to newly implemented footholds, handholds and scheduled rest periods, rendezvous in orbit is not a straightforward maneuver. Should a spacecraft increase its speed to catch up with another, the result is that it goes into a higher and slower orbit and the distance thereby increases. The right procedure is to go to a lower orbit first and which increases relative speed, and then approach the target spacecraft from below and decrease orbital speed to meet it. To practice these maneuvers special rendezvous and docking simulators were built for the astronauts. <laughs> Gemini Titan launches and serial numbers The Gemini Titan II launch vehicle was adapted by NASA from the U.S. Air Force Titan II ICBM. Similarly, the Mercury Atlas launch vehicle had been adapted from the USAF Atlas missile. The Gemini Titan II rockets were assigned Air Force serial numbers, which were painted in four places on each Titan II on opposite sides on each of the first and second stages. USAF crews maintained Launch Complex 19 and prepared and launched all of the Gemini Titan II launch vehicles. Data and experience operating the Titans was of value to both the U.S. Air Force and NASA. The USAF serial numbers assigned to the Gemini Titan launch vehicles are given in the tables above. Fifteen Titan IIs were ordered in 1962, so the serial is 62 to 12 XXX, but only 12 XXX is painted on the Titan II. 
The order for the last three of the 15 launch vehicles was cancelled on July 30, 1964, and they were never built. Serial numbers were, however, assigned to them prospectively, 12,568 GLV-13, 12,569 GLV-14, and 12,570 GLV-15. Topic: Program cost. From 1962 to 1967, Gemini cost $1.3 billion in $1,967 billion in 2018. In January 1969, a NASA report to the U.S. Congress estimating the costs for Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo through the first manned moon landing included $1.2834 billion for Gemini, $797.4 million for spacecraft, $409.8 million for launch vehicles, and $76.2 million for support. Current location of hardware Spacecraft Gemini 1, disintegrated upon re-entry to the atmosphere Gemini 2, Air Force Space and Missile Museum, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, Florida Gemini 3, Grissom Memorial, Spring Mill State Park, Mitchell, Indiana Gemini IV, National Air and Space Museum, Washington, D.C. Gemini V, Johnson Space Center, NASA, Houston, Texas Gemini VI, Oklahoma History Center, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma Gemini 7, Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center, Chantilly, Virginia Gemini 8, Armstrong Air and Space Museum, Wapakoneta, Ohio Gemini IX, Kennedy Space Center, NASA, Merritt Island, Florida Gemini X, Kansas Cosmosphere and Space Center, Hutchinson, Kansas Gemini 11, California Museum of Science and Industry, Los Angeles, California Gemini 12, Adler Planetarium, Chicago, Illinois Topic Trainers Gemini 3A, St. Louis Science Center, St. Louis, Missouri Gemini Mole B, National Museum of the United States Air Force, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Dayton, Ohio Gemini Trainer, U.S. Space and Rocket Center, Huntsville, Alabama Gemini Trainer, Kentucky Science Center, Louisville, Kentucky 6165, GATV, National Air and Space Museum, Washington, D.C. Not on display, El Cabong, Kalamazoo Air Museum, Kalamazoo, Michigan Gemini Trainer, Kalamazoo Air Museum, Kalamazoo, Michigan TTV2, National Space Center, Leicester, UK Trainer, Pate Museum of Transportation, Fort Worth, Texas MSC 313, Private Residence, San Jose, California Rogallo Test Vehicle, White Sands Space Harbor, White Sands, New Mexico TTV 1, Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center, Chantilly, Virginia Unnamed, Air Force Space and Missile Museum, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, Florida Unnamed, Air Force Space and Missile Museum, Museum, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, Florida Ingress – Egress Trainer, U.S. Space and Rocket Center, Huntsville, Alabama MSC-307, USS Hornet Museum, former NAS Alameda, Alameda, California Proposed extensions and applications Topic: Advanced Gemini. 
McDonnell Aircraft, the main contractor for Mercury and Gemini, was also one of the original bidders on the prime contract for Apollo, but lost out to North American Aviation. McDonnell later sought to extend the Gemini program by proposing a derivative which could be used to fly a cislunar mission and even achieve a manned lunar landing earlier and at less cost than Apollo, but these proposals were rejected by NASA. A range of applications were considered for advanced Gemini missions, including military flights, space station crew and logistics delivery, and lunar flights. The lunar proposals ranged from reusing the docking systems developed for the Agena target vehicle on more powerful upper stages such as the Centaur, which could propel the spacecraft to the Moon, to complete modifications of the Gemini to enable it to land on the lunar surface. Its applications would have ranged from manned lunar flybys before Apollo was ready, to providing emergency shelters or rescue for stranded Apollo crews, or even replacing the Apollo program. Some of the advanced Gemini proposals used, "...off-the-shelf", Gemini spacecraft, unmodified from the original program, while others featured modifications to allow the spacecraft to carry more crew, dock with space stations, visit the Moon, and perform other mission objectives. Other modifications considered included the addition of wings or a parasail to the spacecraft, in order to enable it to make a horizontal landing. Topic. Big Gemini Big Gemini or Big G, was another proposal by McDonnell Douglas made in August 1969. It was intended to provide large capacity, all-purpose access to space, including missions that ultimately used Apollo or the Space Shuttle. The study was performed to generate a preliminary definition of a logistic spacecraft derived from Gemini that would be used to resupply an orbiting space station. Land landing at a preselected site and refurbishment and reuse were design requirements. Two baseline spacecraft were defined, a nine-man minimum modification version of the Gemini B called Min Mod Big G and a 12-man advanced concept, having the same exterior geometry but with new, state-of-the-art subsystems, called Advanced Big G3 launch vehicles Saturn IB, Titan IIIM, and Saturn Int 20 SIC, SIVB were investigated for use with the spacecraft. Topic. Military applications The Air Force had an interest in the Gemini system, and decided to use its own modification of the spacecraft as the crew vehicle for the Manned Orbital Laboratory. To this end, the Gemini 2 spacecraft was refurbished and flown again atop a mock-up of the mole, sent into space by a Titan IIIC. This was the first time a spacecraft went into space twice. The USAF also had the notion of adapting the Gemini spacecraft for military applications, such as crude observation of the ground no specialized reconnaissance camera could be carried and practicing making rendezvous with suspicious satellites. This project was called Blue Gemini. The USAF did not like the fact that Gemini would have to be recovered by the U.S. Navy, so they intended for Blue Gemini eventually to use the airfoil and land on three skids, carried over from the original design of Gemini. At first some within NASA welcomed sharing of the cost with the USAF, but it was later agreed that NASA was better off operating Gemini by itself. Blue Gemini was cancelled in 1963 by Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, who decided that the NASA Gemini flights could conduct necessary military experiments. MOLE was cancelled by Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird in 1969, when it was determined that unmanned spy satellites could perform the same functions much more cost-effectively. In media 
two Gemini capsules codenamed Jupiter instead of Gemini are featured in the plot of the 1967 James Bond film You Only Live Twice. A modified one-man Gemini capsule is used to send an astronaut played by James Kahn to the Moon in the 1968 film Countdown. See also Splashdown spacecraft landing Timeline of hydrogen technologies U.S. space exploration history on U.S. stamps <laughs>